Hey, welcome back to episode four of What Happened to You. Today, William Ogden and I talk about our experiences getting molested and potential ways to prevent molestation from happening in the future. When I started putting all that content out, like the reactions that people had to it, a lot of people that I know were reaching out saying that they were also molested. Yeah. Um, some people were saying that they'd never told anybody about it before, which was just crazy. And I, I'm just so glad like, this is exactly what I want this to be. It's just an open forum for people to talk about experiences that are generally just sort of swept under the rug and people don't feel comfortable talking about because I really think that our best defense against molestation is talking about it. A lot of people will say to me like they've been through things, but it's nowhere near as bad as molestation. Um, yeah. And like, I totally get why people think that, but no one should ever diminish the significance of what they've been through just because other people have been through Absolutely. what seems to be worse in their minds. But it's still so cool that like, regardless of what people have been through, when you start telling them about your own experiences they they seem to feel just more open talking about their own um and yeah so it's it's a wild thing you know that we're doing right here is, just um, two guys who got molested talking about it <laughs> on a friday afternoon so here we yeah. are so yeah i may as well just kind of get into it um, sure. So the reason, actually, not, not necessarily this specific reason, but one of the reasons I actually reached out to you is because after watching your, your video about your story, um, there was a point where you mentioned that your uh, a friend that you named Jamie, right? You couldn't have imagined what he was going through. Um, and I don't know what he went through, right? That's his personal experience. Um, but I was molested by my father. Um, so... so I can tell you that experience. Um, is it worse than being blessed by somebody else? I don't know. Um, but uh, it's not good either. Right, obviously. <laughs> you know. So probably I, I've repressed a lot of these memories. Like it's hard to remember because it was so long ago. Um, but probably when I was around like four or five, um, like, and I actually, this was always, but I would, uh, I always slept in my own bed, but sometimes in the morning I'd go and wake my parents up and I'd climb in bed with them. Um, sure. um and there were, you know, eventually my mom would get out and sometimes my dad would stay in bed. Right. Um, and you know, we would just wrestle or whatever. Um, but like sometimes he would do like really weird stuff. Like he would like literally pin me down and like, put his balls in my face yeah right? well. like that was really strange i i remember being like i don't like this right but it like didn't bother me that much um you know i was just like oh this is how you wrestle you show dominance by putting your balls in some <laughs> right <laughs> um it was really nasty it was like you know then he would you know then he kind of ramped it up to where he would um you know he would touch my dick right um, yeah. and he would even, he would even like suck my dick. Right. Which was really weird. Um, and to this day I'm not sexually repressed, uh, but I, I do not enjoy getting my dick sucked, um, at all. Uh, I don't think it's just for that. Maybe it's who knows. I just don't particularly enjoy it. Um, and, and that created some issues too, because of that, like early, early sexual stimulation. Right. I started masturbating when I was like five. Right. Um, and, and I, like, I was like a jackhammer, even, even at that age, dude, I, I don't know if it was like early sexual development or something, but I think it definitely is. It, yeah. It hyper sexualizes you and, yeah. and makes you like, cause that's, we, I, I, when it was happening to me, it started when I was eight and yeah. So you were three years before me. It's like, we are not even at puberty yet. No, no, not even close, right? The thing of it is, though, is I, like, in the moment, I, I kind of liked it, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense that, like, and that's what's really messed up about it, right? But that's all I knew, right? I was homeschooled um, at that time. I, I went to public school in seventh grade. But at that time, right, I was homeschooled. So that's all I knew, right? And I was like, oh, this is okay. This is just what dads do with their son, right? Yeah. They, you know, play with their son's little dick and, you know, stick their balls in their face and whatnot. And this would literally, this literally became a, 
like ritual, like a thing we would do like every Friday. Um, so, uh, or however many days I literally couldn't count the number of times, um, in the hundreds, probably just, just to put a random number up, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then probably when I was around eight, I had this friend, uh, who I'll call, um, James. James and Jamie. Perfect. Yeah. And you might have to, you, you can cut it out if I accidentally say his real name. Sure. Um, but, um, he, uh, he was a good friend of mine. He was a couple years older than me though. Um, and he had a really rough upbringing, um, in terms of like, like, even though obviously my dad molested me, he was never like aggressive or anything like that. Or I guess he was, I don't know. This kid had issues though, from his parents being assholes. But anyways, uh, this friend would come over and we'd hang out. Um, and one day we had a sleepover, um, and my dad was like, oh, perfect opportunity, double the fun, right? Um, so he molested both of us, right? Um, and I don't think my friend even realized what was going on either. He was probably 10 or 11. I was probably eight. Was it like at the same time, like and you were both like awake and like, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, straight up. It, I mean, it, it doesn't get much weirder than that. Like, I was like, what, what is going on here? Um, <laughs> yeah. And that happened a few times, right? And then eventually, um, my, you know, buddy, uh, James, he was like, um, he, he realized something and he, he called the freaking cops, right? Uh, he called CPS, right? So CPS got involved in, and I remember the day they came to the door, um, and, and told my mom, you know, what was going on. And she was like, oh, this is crazy. Um, and I remember, oh man, it, it was just insane. Everybody was crying. Um, but that, oh, that makes me think I totally forgot about this. One of the reasons I still to this day resent my mother is because she knew about the molestation before that. Mm. Um, I, my dad was like, it's kind of funny how my dad, like, um, oh, how do I, how do I describe this? He, he cared about me, right? At the same time he was doing this. So like one time I was talking to him and he's like, oh, all right, don't tell anybody about this thing we do, Right. But don't let anybody else do it to you either, right? Don't let any strangers do that. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I don't want strangers touching me, but that's that's a relationship I have just with my dad, right? Yeah. Um, but then one time I mentioned it to ma my mom passingly, not even thinking about it. And she was like, um, what the fuck, right? Uh, and But that was the last I ever heard. Like, that was like when I was like seven. So it went on for another year after that. She never did anything about it. So, so um, you told her and she was like, that was her first time finding out about it was when you told yeah. her. Yeah. When I mentioned, I, I mentioned it passingly and she was like, um, what? I was like, yeah, he touches my dick. Right. And she's like, uh, he can't do that. Right. Yeah. But then, but she didn't do anything about it. It didn't make sense to me, but whatever. So she didn't do anything. Right. And then, uh, you know, a, a year or two later, right. CPS gets involved and, um, she was like, uh, I mean, same kind of thing. Not that she didn't care, but she just didn't know what was going on. And, um, and part of it is she never knew how bad it was, right? I never told her how bad it was. But at that point, I still liked my dad. I still loved my dad. He was still my father. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to lie. Right. Um, now the interesting thing is how, I'm, like, an eight-year-old brain works how a eight-year-old decides to lie the lie oop, the lie i basically told is oh he touched me once right mm -hmm. and i this is what to this day i feel bad about this i i said no he never touched never touched james right um and that's that's what really like for literally years i you know i told everybody that this friend was an asshole and he was lying but everything he said was true right mm -hmm. so i I, I was the, you know, I was the Jamie in that situation. Um, wow. I, I mean, not to say I'm an asshole. Or Jamie no, no, asshole, but not I, at all. I defended my father, right? Yeah. Um, so basically there ended up being a restraining order, which lasted for a couple of years. Um, but you never went to jail or anything. Did you guys um, go to court? So we did go to court, right? Um, we did go to court, but I don't think the charges whatever the charges were basically would have never put him in jail or anything like that. But we were trying to get the restraining order removed. Right. 
my mom wanted the restraining order removed and so did I, right? At the- it was the restraining order with, with with you and your dad, not with James and your dad. Oh, both, right? Both. Um, so with, with both of us, right? Um, and now, now I never went to court. I never stepped foot in court. Um, I'm not sure how the situation is there. I mean, you said you went to court. I... I never, I spoke to a police officer once very shortly and that was it. That was the last time I, I had any involvement in the legal process. Um, probably because I was a little bit younger. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I think I it's state to state anyway. too. Um, yeah, it's different everywhere for sure. Cause it, for me, literally I, every one of my friends had to testify. Um, people that weren't, it, it, didn't say they were molested or anything. It was anyone who had spent the night at yeah. Jamie's house had to testify. Um, but that's interesting. Yeah. But sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I was never involved in that legal process. Uh, but, uh, after a couple of years, after two or three years, restraining order was lifted and, uh, my dad came back. Right. And he never lived with us again. Like we had an old house and then we built a new house. Right. Um, we built it as a family or whatever. Um, so in, in that initial time we lived at the old house and he lived at the new house while it was being built. And then we switched. Um, but he would still, he would come over at, you know, every day after work. Right. So he was over multiple hours of the day. Um, uh, so, but it wasn't a big deal. I always wanted, I wanted my dad back. Right. Yeah. And I, I always, my mom like had, like, didn't want me to be with him alone. And I was like, no, screw that. Right. What is he going to do? Right. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do whatever I want with my dad. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this was, you know, this went on for a long time. Um, And along with this, part of the reason why I didn't realize how bad it was, was because I didn't tell anybody, right? Um, And I didn't tell anybody because my mom specifically told me to never tell anyone. Specifically told me never to speak of it um, at all. Uh, Because she didn't want people to think my dad was a monster. Um, And what I realized probably around age 16 is, oh, no, he is a monster, right? He's a literal human piece of garbage, right? (laughs) Um, so I should like literally drag his name through the mud, right? Because that's what he deserved. So there, there was a certain point where I realized just how bad it was. And at this point I did a few things. I, I talked to my mom and I told her how bad it was, um, because she never knew she, she thought I was telling the truth when I said it only happened once. Right. And when you had told her uh, initially, just in in passing, that was just like a one time thing. That's what she thought. Yeah, that that was her impression. Right. Right. Um, I I guess I had apparently lied pretty convincingly, or at least enough to convince her. Clearly not the police, but um, because obviously they they saw right through that bullshit. But um anyways i eventually realized this um and i mentioned it to her i told her exactly how bad it was and at that point she instantly started looking for um uh, a divorce lawyer um and um but even after all that my dad never touched me again but he continued to be verbally abusive and just a general piece of shit right and it's like you get this literal second chance yeah your son right and you're just gonna throw it right in the garbage like, come on. And I realized he's a narcissist. He's, um, I actually, I mean, that's the best way I, to describe him. Actually, he's a narcissist and he's a pedophile. And to this day, I see him looking at children and it creeps me out. I see him looking right. And anytime I see him talk to Wait, a child, child do you, so you still, you still are like hanging out with him? Oh no. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm six or 14 hours away. Um, even after, no, but even after that, like, I mean, he was still over at the house every day, even up until six, like even up up until I just left, I'm 18. Right. I just left. Um, even up until then, I still had to deal with him. Um, wait, you're eight, you're 18 now. Yes. Oh, whoa. So this is like super recent. This is like right now going on. Yeah. I, I, I (laughs) like, so I just, I mean, it's not the only reason I moved here, but like, yeah, yeah. I'm getting the fuck out of here. Dude, good right? for you, man. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I don't want to run away from my problems. Obviously, there's all kinds of reasons for me to have moved here. I love it here. Um, but, I mean, that was just another reason. Um, so, man, I'm trying to think of any other specific, I guess, uh, 
Yeah. Now, I mean, now my mom's pretty, pretty far through the divorce process. Yeah. Um, I hope she takes him for everything he's worth. Um, because even though my mom's not the best person, no, she's a good person at heart. Um, I hope she just completely screws him. Um, because that's what he deserves. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing thinking about, um, the ramifications or like the payback, I guess. Like I remember when, when I was young, I didn't, I didn't want, um, I didn't want any, I, I didn't really give a fuck what happened to Jamie's dad. Like it didn't, I just didn't yeah. want it to be going on anymore. Um, and, and, and I remember like, just sort of feeling like I just wanted it to all go away. Um, I just didn't want yeah. any of it to really be real. And, and I think that's part of why I didn't talk about it for so long, but it's so interesting hearing about the dynamics that existed within your family and how, cause like when I, when all the news came out about what happened to me, there were a number of families that didn't believe me. Um, and they still oh, hung yeah. out with Jamie and his family and would let their kids go over there and stuff. And it seems like when people are involved, when, when somebody that they care about, somebody that they know is accused of something like this, nobody wants to believe that that person could do that. Nobody wants yeah. to admit, nobody wants to come to terms with the fact that like your husband or your friend's dad or whoever, whatever your relationship to the person is. It's like a lot of people will like, we use the, we use this phrase. It was like sticking your head in the sand, like an ostrich. And you just like, don't want to ignore, you just try to ignore all of these like obvious signs that, that point to this person being a molester. And it seems like with your mom, it's like, you know, obviously given the, given the information that she had really, when you said it, that it happened once you you'd think that that would be enough to act on it but the truth is it's so much more complicated than that it is it is right um and it's hard to it's hard to say i feel like at that point their marriage was already like shit right i i am very surprised that she did not take action um and to this day i've never spoken to her about that specifically about the fact that she never because i had repressed that memory i actually just realized this like a couple days ago when I, I was like mentally preparing for this conversation and I realized that like I was in the car and I was just like, Oh, that's, that's why like I subconsciously like resent my mother. Um, like she could have done something about this. It's um, so weird how memories work like that. I, right. I fucking forgot the entire first year of molestation that happened to me until I was on the stand <laughs> literally yeah. in court. And I rem and had this like crazy flashback flood of memories that came back uh, dude, and like the freaking wiggle game, bro. The wiggle game. That's right. Yeah. And dude, that is such a molester thing to call that. <laughs> like, dude, it, like that is so damning. Like it, the name is just so sick. It's just like so. You're right. It's so it, it's molesting. Disgusting. And it it's like literally disgusting. Yeah, and it it was so effective in normalizing what would evolve into like the actual molestation. I mean, that was that was molestation yeah. too. But it was just like, I mean, the guy had a whole system. And it was he was clearly like well versed in the skill yeah. of child Based molestation. Based on how you describe that, it does not sound like you were the only person who uh, he had targeted. No, well, there was a uh, there was a guy who reached out uh, after the trial because there were like a bunch of news news articles and things uh, published about the court case, and there was a guy who reached out and said that um, the same guy had molested him like. 15 wow. years ago. Um, Damn. And so he was reaching out basically just to just be like, Hey, just believe this kid is what he was saying. Um, and uh, that's another thing is it's like the, it's very rare for molesters to just do it once. You know, it's like, a, it's a, it's a, oh, it's yeah. a very repetitive behavior. Uh, and it's, it's very rare for it to just be a one-time thing as evidenced by, you know, the guy who did it to me and then your dad involving yeah. uh, your friend, James. Um, and it's so, 
because because we don't talk about it, it never gets treated. Like one thing I was thinking about is like, I don't know if there's anywhere that like you can go to right now where like, let's say somebody is starting to real because nobody just like molests a kid in the off chance that they're like curious, maybe I'll like this. Like they know they that it's it's premeditated always. And I I wonder if there's a way that we could provide services to people that are like having thoughts like basically catch pre-pedophiles um yeah. and because it seems like because it's so like nobody would ever want to admit to even having those thoughts that like it may be if there's some i don't know that part of why i want it part of the goal of all of this 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 podcast and just talking about this stuff is brainstorming potential ways to fight this problem and that's just one of one of the ideas but um yeah but yeah, uh, it's it's so it's so wild hearing <laughs> this exactly. story and like it feels like I feel like I'm getting just as you said I feel like I'm getting insight into what Jamie's experience was probably like because no yeah. kid in their right mind wants to get rid of their dad. It's like no matter what exactly. they do to you, it's your dad. So so um, what what's what happened with your relationship with um, James? I, I never saw him again. Never saw him again. And I hated him. I hated him so much for, for messing up my life and screwing everything up. And it was only um, recently where I'm like, oh, my God. I, like, I was in the wrong here. He was clearly, like, a victim, right? Just as much of a victim as I was, right? Um, and I'm like, I, my lying, you know, could have hurt him, right? And that just, that, that made me feel so bad. Um, and, but I mean, obviously like, I'm like, I was eight, right? That's just how they are. They're, um, they're mentally, they're stupid. Yeah. They're stupid eight year olds. So they're dumb. I don't like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not like going to bed, like not getting sleep because I was never able to uh, fix that. But yeah, I never saw, never saw him again. That brings up a good point, which is that I think that we all have a tendency to, um, treat our past selves like we expect us to have acted in the way that like we would have we would act now like we don't give ourselves enough slack for behaving ridiculously at that age like I think for a while I beat myself up about not saying something sooner like why did it take me two years to tell yeah. somebody about this and then the longer it went on the harder it felt like it was to say something because I thought that People would just be like, oh, why the fuck uh, that you liked it? Yeah, you, you, you know, yeah. I thought I was worried that people would think I was gay. And because I, I was the same way. Here. I had I got boners while it was going on, too. And like that is such a clusterfuck of emotions exactly. and thoughts right. to be dealing with at it, that age. It doesn't make you gay. Like, like somebody touching your dick. It feels good, right? You yeah. Know? And but that's it but, feels nice, right? Yeah, but people, but that's another, it's just another sort of component that goes into this equation of why people don't say something. There's so many factors and it's different for each person. But I remember, dude, <laughs> dude, I thought, I literally thought that if I said, if I told my parents and they told people about the molestation, that Jamie's dad was going to be like, yeah, but he had boners. Like he liked it, and then I thought that was gonna be the end of it. I thought that made it okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was but why I didn't say something. Not. And <laughs> this is why, like, both of us had no idea, right? And this is why I think that the education around it needs to be improved. Um, I I don't care if it means teaching kids about sex at six years old. I don't care what it means. We need to teach kids, right? You know how you said there was like the good touch and the bad touch? Now, let's let's not, I don't think we should, we should uh, like uh, water it down for children. We should say if somebody's touching your dick, right, that's illegal and they should go to jail, right? I understand why people don't want to introduce their kids to sex too early, but it's the, the risk is drastically outweighs what you're preventing because they're going to discover it like a couple of years from from yeah. then anyway and it's like the damage that you can prevent by making kids aware of this potential threat is so much worse it's so, it's so worth it compared to the like limited no, it is. but but it, it can, it, yeah 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that good touch, bad touch, it's so wild because that was the thing that actually allowed me to say something. And it, it, it even though I literally couldn't express with my words what was going on, it was my mom eventually being like, was it a good touch like teacher? I think I forget her name now, but whatever my teacher had mentioned in, in class. And I was like, yes. And it's like, you know, if if I, I, I imagine that if I had been educated or like in more detail in more with more concrete examples, there are ways to express to kids that there are things that adults can do that will make you feel uncomfortable. And basically, whatever it is, you have to tell somebody. Um, but I completely agree. That's that's one of the main things that has to change about the way our society handles yeah. child molestation in order to make any significant difference is I agree. arming kids with a defense. Because like <clears throat> I was talking to my dad about this the other day, like there were a number of things that I did sort of subtly as a kid, like expressing like not wanting to spend time with Jamie's dad. Um, there, there, there are, th I feel like kids leave like this, this, it's like a trail of breadcrumbs, right. That lead to the molestation, but you're absolutely most parents aren't in tune with these signs because they're so subtle. And a lot of the time, because kids don't want to be found out, they, they don't even really want you to know, but they know that there's something that's not making them feel good and they don't want it to be happening anymore. But you're fucking eight. You don't have the tools to defend yourselves and you don't you can't even say like most words yeah. yet. So I, I totally yeah. agree with you. There needs to be a way to yeah. uh, educate kids, but also parents like if there's Absolutely. ever if your kid ever says that they don't like another parent for any reason. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that they're getting molested by them. There were tons of parents that I didn't like growing yeah. up. But you have to treat every bit of information or, or not not treat it as a molestation sign, but you have to be aware that it could be. And you can't just brush it off as like that yeah. parent's mean or strict or whatever. It's like, you know, we as parents, like you just got to be um, sort of just more in tune with it, I guess. And so it's really an it really just we need like a full education uh, uh, revamp or whatever for kids and parents. Um, I think also is it like some, some parents uh, tell their kids like you should always listen to adults. Um, and that just, that is not helpful either um, because you shouldn't always listen to adults because some adults are just as stupid as children. Right. And some adults are malicious. Right. Um, and the stranger danger thing doesn't work either because usually the vast majority of molestation cases are not strangers, right? They're not, it's, you know, it's your, you know, your father, uncle, friends, dad, uh, pastor, whatever, right? It's any, any number of, you know, or, or it could be a woman, right? Yeah. It's people that um, are close to you way more often than not. Yeah. In stranger danger, I mean, maybe it's just because it rhymes, but that's like so prominent, I think, in the minds of kids. Yeah. Like everyone knows that. And probably just because, you know, stranger danger, that's all you really need to know to not go get in somebody's car. They, you don't know that like they might rape you or whatever, molest you when you're in the car. People don't want to tell kids that. And I think that there's just there's a sweet spot. There's there's you got to find the balance between educating kids and not sugarcoating it, but also not like, you know, fucking them up mentally. But um, I yeah, I agree. And I think that most people would agree on that. I think that the people that aren't going to agree on that are in the same sort of uh, area as the people who would like stick their head in the sand and not want to realize like that somebody close to them was a molester. It's like not wanting to come to terms with the fact that. Exactly. People do this all the time. Literally one in five kids get molested. That's, that is insane. Oh that, that is like the one in five. I 20% of our youth are getting molested by adults. And it's when, like, I don't even know how, how we can be not putting, you know, millions and millions of dollars into education about this, about this stuff. Yeah, that is, that is legit. I did not know that factor, right? That is messed up. Dude, it's like, it's an epidemic. That's that is that is ridiculous. And it's yeah, it's oh, one yeah. in four one in four girls, one in six boys. So it's uh 
And when you hear a number like that, I mean, it's almost, it's, it's like such an insane percentage of the population. And then when you multiply that, like, and obviously that you can't just take children, right? It's everybody because molestation has been an all time problem, right? So then you have to multiply that by 365 million, right? I mean, what's I mean, a fifth of that is what, like 50 million, 70 million, 70 million people. And probably, probably half of them or even more have never said anything, right? Well, right. that's what I do. Well, that's of reported they cases. Passed, they might not even remember it. Yeah, that's, that's and, only of reported cases. So yeah, like that I number can, is I way can more. I barely even remember, right? You yeah, know, most was, people don't. Uh, most people don't say anything. The majority of people no. don't report. So it's like, you know, it's when you factor in. I mean, as if twenty, as if twenty percent or twenty five percent or twenty percent wasn't enough. It's like, yeah, holy shit! It's um, yeah, it's one of the biggest problems that we're facing as a society. And also, like, you know, it's I, I forget the exact numbers, but the majority of child molesters were molested. Um, and it just went yeah. untreated and which is even more of a reason to start educating people, because if we could like, for example, if we were able to drastically cut down that number, that percentage of people that get molested, that's like, you're like cutting right to the root of the problem because molesters breed other molesters. And if we can actually like drastically reduce the number of kids that are getting molested now, then when they grow up, it's the number will. I mean, that's that's the thing about this is that we really can have a huge impact on this pro on on solving this problem literally just by talking about it and by spreading awareness exactly. about it. It's it it's that cost simple. A single dime. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. Like you said, recently you started talking about your molestation experience. Um, what caused that? What what sort of initiated that? That's such an interesting thing. I I don't know. It was just a, it was a, sh actually, you know what? I, I know exactly what it was. Um, my uh, youth pastor uh, at my church, I'm a Christian, my youth pastor at my church, who uh, is an incredibly good friend of mine, um, not it, and not just because, you know, it's his job to be your friend. No, he was literally, he is literally to this day, even after he quit the job, one of my best friends. Um, and one day he was um, giving a message in a small group. Um, and it, something about respecting your parents, regardless of anything came up. And I was just like, no, I, I do not agree with this there. I do not think the Bible supports this conclusion. Um, and he kind of shut that down. So later on, I told him, I, I said, I, let me explain why. And then I told him that whole story. And that was the first time I'd told anybody. Wow. And he was like, oh, that makes sense. Right. And, and obviously it fills in a lot of gaps too, because everybody was like, why does your dad not live with you? Right. I had to explain that to people. Right. Or like, I always had to come up with some elaborate lie. Right. I was like, oh, it's because he's working on the house or, or because uh, he and my mom had a disagreement or something like that. No, it was because he molested me. Right. But nobody knew that. Right. So I told him, and after saying that it was the best, it was like the best thing I ever felt in my entire life. Um, it was like the best thing. And I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. Now I'm just going to like, I'm going to literally drag my dad's face through the mud now that I have this opportunity. This feels so good. So then I, I slowly told everybody I knew. Um, and uh, eventually I got to the point where I'm just like, I'll just, you know, talk to a dude I met on the internet about this, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And and now, now the whole internet gets to see, right? But I want them to see because um, like... I mean, can you imagine if my dad remarries, right, and has, like, stepchildren? Now, if that happens, I, I will be getting on the phone and, and making a uh, interesting phone call. Um, well, it's an interesting point that you bring up about the responsibility that we sort of take on ourselves yeah. with regards to protecting others from people that we know have done things to, to us. But before we talk about that, I wanted to just say that – it, you, even just hearing you say that that moment after you told your pa your youth pastor about your experience and how yeah. good it felt, that that feeling is accessible to anyone that has been through trauma. That exactly that feeling is it's I I felt the exact same thing when I did stand up about it. 
it was like this insane like uh rush and it feels like just a weight off your shoulders and it feels like you get your it feels like you're getting power back from something yeah. that has had so such a so much power over you for so long and and then it, and i think that that like that moment is it's so fucking cool dude it is it's like it and it, it doesn't cost anything right all you got to do is speak and like it's it's like i i would literally compare it to the first time i like smoked weed like like it was <laughs> no, it wasn't it was even it was way better it was right? better it was, it was better, better. dude like, i it know was just, it was just this like amazing feeling like oh my gosh i could do anything and i feel so strong uh, and to this day i feel stronger for it right i mean not to say that i you know i i'm glad it happened but like i'm it i do not think i am a worse person for it um and someday I'd like to be a father and I'd like to be a better father than my dad. And the more I thought about it, like for a while, I was like, I don't know if I want to have kids. I don't want to turn into my father. Right. Because there were a lot of character traits I shared with him. Like I had some anger issues as a child. Um, and then eventually I'm just like, oh, no, I can just like see these little things that my dad does and just stop doing those. And then uh, and then I'm like. All I have to do to be a, a better father than my dad is not molest my child. Right? <laughs> yeah, I the bar the be, bar could, could not be lower. Be like, um, but that's like that's that. a great that's a great point though. Yeah. Is that like reflecting on trauma and like the 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 people that you've experienced in your life who have put you through things? Like, I mean, it's sort of, it is sort of like a roadmap on how to not that you need to be molested to figure out that you shouldn't be a molester. Of course, yeah. <laughs> like it's not. It's not like that, but um, you can learn a lot from from these experiences, and like particularly like like dude, I after I did stand up for the first time about it, I literally was just ru- I I went I left the comedy club and was just running through the streets of New York, just like screaming, like just at the top of my lungs, just like <laughs> yeah, d- exactly. I just felt like it was the most euphoric feeling I've ever felt, yeah. and I've done psychedelics and smoke weed very consistently. <laughs> like, oh, no, you know, dude, it's have like you ever, uh, have you ever tried LSD on mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, I love both of those, <laughs> dude. I've always wanted to try them, never had the opportunity. Yeah, it's um, yeah. they're they're it's very important to do them in a situation where you feel comfortable and preferably yeah. out in nature. But if you get the set and setting right, it can be, uh, yeah, very, very life uh, changing, profound experiences, particularly with uh, with mushrooms that you just feel like totally connected with everything that's going on around you. You feel like you are part of this ama- amazing yeah. experience rather than a stranger in it. You're part of the world. We have this amazing ability to work our bodies without thinking about it at all yeah. our blood circulating our lungs breathing our brains thinking everything we have the, we get to have this experience and mushrooms uh heighten those heighten those sensations and just make you aware of it and make you feel totally connected with everything around you so Man. i would highly recommend it especially if you like weed but but sorry to to go back to uh to what you were saying um i i i you once you feel that it's like you want everyone it it's like it's such a polar opposite of what has been like a lifelong experience of suppression and yeah. not wanting to feel anything wanting to just act like it never happened to like all of a sudden you feel like completely empowered it, like you said you feel like stronger you feel like you can do yeah. anything and like i think that if people who have been through things hear that that's a possibility i mean i i like to think that that would encourage them to speak up about whatever they've been through too uh so i just i just had a couple of you know like completely random unrelated thoughts that that kind of relate one of them is that recently actually again this was this was just after um sending you a message i um looked into trying to get my court records um, because I was never involved in the case. So I never knew what happened. I want to know what happened. So I'm trying to acquire whatever records there were. Um, and hopefully I can get them. Dude, you want to see something funny? Dude, you got a pile of court records right next to you, don't you? 
What the fuck? <laughs> Dude, this is the entire transcript of every single person that spoke in the trial, including, like, I have everything here. I have my own testimony, like, all the people. I mean, this is thick as fuck. Like, this is this is so thick. And, like, dude, I have um these emails printed off here that were emails that me and Jamie's dad... I was trying to contact Jamie because I was on, like, a family vacation. And I was playing yeah. RuneScape, and Jamie and I shared an account. And I was trying to fucking message him about how it's going well. And then his dad would just respond... And basically just be like, sorry, Jamie's not available, but like, how are you? And he started talking about like, like they have all of these, in all these uh, emails, they've got like instances where he's like talking about showering and like talking about oh. me showering, all, all of this shit that, dude, the prosecutor of our trial was like an absolute dingus. Like she didn't include any of these emails. My dad printed them all off and gave them to her. And she was like, we don't need it. Like, it's going to be an easy win. Like, we've got this case on lock yeah, that's or whatever. So stupid. I would throw everything at them. I'd why, why, them. Yeah, I, why would you ever I, not I, include I, more I, evidence? But I, anyway, just to show you, you should do it. Because I've read through almost all of this. And it's so fascinating to, to see, like, you know, the all the perspectives that were that were involved in the trial. And, like, you know reading about it like it's crazy reading the guy's de deposition the guy who molested me and just being like oh my god like it's just i mean everything is a lie yeah he's literally full of shit it's like hours and hours of questioning and just like lying <laughs> it's so wild man but that's funny that i happen to have it right next to me yeah. Um, but yeah what were your other thoughts you should definitely definitely get the deposition oh hopefully i i really hope i get it um because you know and I, I was never in uh, involved in any capacity, so I have no idea what happened in court. No clue what was going on. Um, so I want to find out. But the other thought, and this is kind of unrelated, but do you know who uh, Mr. Repsion is on YouTube? No. Who's that? Okay. He's a, he's a guy. He's a huge uh, anti-Onision YouTuber, if that makes sense. I don't know if you know who Onision is. No, I don't. Onision is this creepy guy who molests people too, and then Chris Hansen kind of got after him. But, anyways, uh, long story short, I watched this video the other day that was titled "This website should be banned." This website is called Rapey.co, and it is literally a imagine Reddit for pedophiles. It is a literal website. You, this is not a dark web like you have to use Tor browser to get to website. This is a website you could go to anytime you want, rapey.co, that has pedophiles on it who ask each other for advice on how to be better pedos and share pictures of their children with each other. Holy shit. This is a legitimate website. It is disgusting. How... It's always so mind blowing when you hear about something like that, and it's like, well, how can we not just shut that down like immediately? Exactly. Like, how is it that like censorship in terms of like, like YouTube, right, censors everything, right, right, and some websites get shut down immediately, but you know, b but this, right, like this somehow is able to exist, right? Um, it's yeah, it's absolutely mind blowing, um, and I. I hope that, you know, somebody's able to dox all of those people. Yeah. Um, well, there, sh there should be, and, you know, in line with what we were talking about earlier about possible prevention methods, um, you know, not just for physical molestation, but online, you know, distribution of child pornography, things like that. Like, there should really be, like, a whole team dedicated to just shutting down yeah. websites like that. And, and, like, there is some huge there is a huge like child and just human trafficking problem in general in the world right now like there are so many slaves like there i don't know if this is true or not but i've heard there's more slaves now than there have ever been right and that's just fuck dude right the idea that somebody owns another human being like it's not i don't think it's a huge problem in this country but in other countries obviously it's a big deal um that human trafficking but the idea that somebody would would like literally snatch up a child to turn them into a sexual like a uh, uh, you know a just a just an object right for this it, it's disgusting and disturbing 
and we could do so much about it, but we're not. Um, like all of these, and this is what one of the things that bothers me about politics. These are like issues that actually matter, and nobody's talking about them. It, it's like as soon as you start talking about things that make people feel uncomfortable, like child molestation, people just kind of shut off because it's easier to just not think about it. That's why it's such a problem is it's yeah. so much easier to just turn a blind eye to it. And I think that's why a lot of people didn't believe didn't believe me because it's like, well, I, and like, for example, the, the Michael Jackson videos that I did, like, you know, Michael Jackson supporters are like so notorious and infamous for uh, shutting down anything that has to do with him being a pedophile, like ignoring yeah. like the most obvious signs that you could ever have. Um, just because that's their idol, you know, if, if, yeah. if your idol ends up being a child molester, you have to reevaluate a lot of the principles that you founded your life on and people just don't want to do that. And yeah. even though really that's an opportunity for growth and like coming into your own and being more authentic and not necessarily just tying yourself to some figure like Michael Jackson, like it's just hard. I mean, that's really what it is, is that it's just hard to talk about this and, and just fucking deal with it. But I think what we can do by talking about it is just show people that not only can you recover and begin to heal from the experiences that you've had, but you can literally transform it into like a superpower, <laughs> like Absolutely. just like that feeling that we were talking about. What we need to do is we need to like find a way to... Um, you know, tell people about this, which is either through activism or I don't even care. Like I'll let, let's write a freaking book about it, dude. You know? <laughs> yeah. Let's just a, a way of collecting all the thoughts into one. Right. So everybody can know this because everybody needs to hear your story. Right. Everybody needs to hear my story. Everybody needs to, you know, know, you know, know how to spot the signs. Um, and, and we just need to talk about it and we need to support that. Um, so, I think um, that any, any, yeah. literally any avenue that you can spread information on is it, it should be used to, to spread this message. And whether that's a book or a podcast or, I mean, whatever it is, it's like, what I've noticed is, for example, when I posted the stand up initially, I posted it on, I, I didn't post the video anywhere except for YouTube, yeah. but I made like an Instagram post saying like, Hey, you should check out this video. And then a Facebook post saying, hey, I made this video. And on um, on both of those posts, there were a ton of like really encouraging comments. Yeah. And like a bunch of people reached out to me individually. Some people just called me and talked about their experiences or or just talked about, you know, their response to it, whatever it was. But it's I, I, I think there was only one friend that I had, I think, that shared it. Um, yeah. And that was only because I had mentioned to him how no one was sharing it, which it wasn't, you know, it, which was totally fine. It was mo the reason I'm bringing this up is because it highlights the, the, the reaction that people have to it, which is they're moved by it, but it's not something that you really share. It's not so it's not going to go viral in the same way that TikToks or, or whatever does. It's like it's so exactly. much different that, you know, because that's not what people go on Facebook to see or, or Instagram to see. It's like you, you go for quick hits of dopamine, not like, you know, shit that like people, a lot of people were reaching out to me saying that I should include like a trigger warning um, or something like that. And I was like, yeah, like, I mean, I, I agree with the sentiment. Like I, I think that it would be helpful so that people, you know, can kind of know what they're getting into. But I also don't really think that we should associate a warning with this content. Like, I almost think that that could be counterproductive because the goal is to normalize conversations about it and make it known that, like, it's OK for you to be triggered by this. Not not Absolutely. in this not in the PC social justice warrior trigger sense, but in the sense that you might have memories that come up that you haven't thought about in fucking 20 years, you know, just yeah. by hearing somebody else talk about their experience. So like, I think that I know that this will work. I know that it's just it's just it's it's going to take time. It's going to take effort and energy. And that's fine. There's no rush for it, you know. But there also really is a rush <laughs> because the longer yeah. we wait, the more kids get molested. So it's like yeah. every and every time a kid gets molested, we're we're failing. We're failing as a society. And the, I, 
I think what I think what it'll probably what it'll probably be is like, you know, I plan to do conversations like this, you know, for forever. I really enjoy this yeah. kind of stuff. Literally just just talking with you, even if we never showed this to anyone, just talking about it feels good. Physically, it, it, feels, it, awesome. it feels so, yeah, dude, I know. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I think another thing that I've seen it, maybe in the last couple of years is especially with the Me Too movement, and just movements in general in support of rape victims um, and whatnot. Obviously, my heart goes out to all those people, um, but it's just disappointing me, to me to see that like child molestation has just not been included in that, I don't think. Um, or at least, I mean, it has been included to some degree, but it needs to because it's the same It's the same issue. Bro, like, where is Me Too for kids? That's what I'm exactly, 100%. Right? Like, what? Like, why is it? You know what? This is this is a great thing, actually. Let's literally go on Twitter and create hashtag Me Too for kids, right? I mean, this is th like this happens to literally so many people. I would say statistically probably more people, right? And we're just not talking about it. Like we don't even think about this. I, I didn't even think about that until just now, like how that's not even a part of that movement. And that's I really think that that's because the people that the movement is about don't really have a voice yet. The mo the people that are yeah. going through it right now have no way to say what they're even going through. And that's why it's like, it's on us. The people that have yeah. been through it, who can talk about it now to, you know, try to save these kids. And I think that it also comes back to what we were saying earlier about how it just makes people feel bad. It makes people feel gross and nobody wants to think about kids getting molested. And that's yeah. why it's such a problem. And, and until we do something to change that, it's just going to continue being the epidemic that it is. Yeah. And I think at least for the time being, you've got the right idea, which is interviewing people. Because every time you interview somebody, you learn more, right? And every time I watch one of your videos, now, I, now I'm now i part of that interview, so now I know more, right? And that means I can, you know... If I'm if I'm a victim, that means I'm more likely to speak about it because I see people speaking and laughing and being comfortable about it. And I'm more likely to be able to spot the signs, right? Because because we, you know, describe them, right? You actually you did a really good job of this. Um, I think it's because you're again you were a little older, your memory's a little better, but you really talked about the signs, right? About how it happened, right? About how the about the grooming phase. And that's another thing people really need to hear about, right? So every time you talk to another person, right, that it, it just improves your knowledge and everybody who watches it, it improves their knowledge as well. And at least for me as a uh, n another person who's been molested, every time I watch one of those videos, it makes me feel freaking awesome, right? Just to know that there's somebody else who, uh, you know, who went through the same thing I did, um, and and kind of feels the same way and is willing to talk about it. And dude, that's like that's like the most encouraging thing that uh, someone can say to yeah. to me and some people that are making content. It's like that's exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> it's like just so yeah. it's just because in the same way that we you felt good talking about it with your pastor and I felt good doing stand up about it. It's just it still feels like you're just dealing with it every time you talk about it it feels like you're uncovering another layer of this crazy thing that happened to you but the more you talk about it the more you're able to handle it and and process it and and just kind of come to terms with it and not only like re heal from it but like help others heal from it too and um you know it's the audience it's <laughs> it's funny thinking about this stuff because because of how many people get molested, the audience that this content is applicable to is just so massive and it's yeah. global. It's global. It's like, <laughs> it's so crazy, man. It's a horrible thing that it is as many people, that as many people get molested as they do. But it's, it's also very encouraging to know that because we know how many people we really can't help. Just, literally just yeah. by having a conversation about it. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask you another question about the initial phases to get sort of back into the molestation uh, specifically. Like, yeah, when I when it's when it started out for me, I didn't really think like with that wiggle game. I didn't really think that there was anything wrong with it. And I know that you mentioned the same the same thing about it just becoming kind of yeah. normalized. And 
at what point did you realize that this that it was wrong or, or or what at what point did your feelings change from it being kind of like a normal thing or even something that you would look forward to or just didn't mind to a negative sort of uh feeling associated with it so probably when my dad was taken away by cps um is kind of when i got the idea that um like clearly what he did was not right um like he wasn't supposed to do it but again, it probably wasn't until I was maybe 16 where I realized like how bad it was, like it was legitimately an awful thing to do and why it was so bad to do. Right. So it was it was way too late. But I did like I understood in between that time that it wasn't the right thing to do. I guess I just didn't understand why. Um, and then eventually I'm like, I, you know what? This is not complicated. Right. Like adults should not touch children right? They should just not, right? There is a reason we have consent laws, right? There is a very good reason. And I don't think you should have to think about it very much to come to your conclusion. If you have to think about it too, you might be a, you might be a little, uh, yeah, a bit of a pedo, you know? Yeah. But, but it's so hard as, as a kid at that age to have that rational mentality and to be yeah. able to, because it's just so much deeper than that. And, and really the relationships, like, you know, I wanted to preserve my relationship with Jamie. You wanted to preserve your relationship with your dad. And those things, it sounds kind of crazy, but at the time, you're, I, you're really willing to put up with almost anything to keep like the general happiness of, the, of yourself and the people in your life, yeah. like intact, like, I just because Jamie was my best friend, like like we would I mean, me and me and the rest. I mean, I, I had a lot of best friends, but it, at that time, it felt like everybody was competing to be Jamie's best friend. That was like the thing. And I felt like any any time that I wasn't at a sleepover, I was losing out on that opportunity. Yeah. And I knew that if I said something, I didn't know what would happen, but I knew that I, I knew I I. I guess I just inherently knew that I wouldn't be able to be friends with him anymore with Jamie. And that to me was just like unfathomable because that was a, a major consideration in my life at that point was just being friends with this guy. It's yeah. what I really wanted. And I'm also an only child. And so I think I was like uh, even more sort of uh, wanting these relationships um, that I wouldn't have had with a sibling. Um, so there's, it's just, I think it's I think it's always helpful uh, to hear the other people's mindsets at the time. And and I think it can be really, really helpful for people to know that, like, it's you should never feel ashamed uh, for what you thought at that time. And yeah. and I think it's that's that's why so many people don't say anything is, is the shame and the guilt. And uh, and that's by design, you know, when a pedophile, I mean, that's what they do, right? They try to make you feel that, right? So that you won't say anything. Absolutely. It's yeah. like that's when the grooming, right? Like, like what you were saying, it's like the grooming is such an important thing for, for people to be aware of because it's like that's when the groundwork is set. And, and it's like, if it's almost like if you don't say something the first time, it, it feels like you're trapped. It's like yeah. you just can't, at least that's how I felt. And uh, yeah, I get that. And grooming is like, it's so, it's so, it's such a broad term and it could mean anything. But like, for example, Jamie's dad would show us like, um, do you, do you remember funnyjunk.com? No, I never. It was sort of no, just like I, a, it's yeah. like a meme, uh, website that was basically just like soft core jokes about like, like it would be like blowjob jokes, but it would be like a snowman getting a blowjob. It was just sexual content. Yeah that he was allowing us to see and he would be there for it. And it's creating that it, he created this environment that was like so fun to be in. And so like at, at that age, all you want to do is do other things that older people can, older kids can do. You want yeah. to be playing T rated games or M rated games or whatever it is. And so it felt like he was treating us more like adults almost. I don't know. He just made this environment that like you wanted to be a part of. And because it was so fun, I was willing to put up with getting molested to be a part of it. 
and it's just like it's all just like this groundwork that they that they lay down to sort of create the create the trap Uh, same thing here with the wrestling me and my dad like would wrestle right before every time right you know i i loved the wrestling i thought it was fun but obviously he's bigger and stronger so eventually he would win and right when he wins he would molest me right um and oh, so like, it was like a, it was like a, reward, it was a competition. And if he uh, won, then he would do that. Yeah. I mean, that's one way to put it. Yeah. It, it wasn't always that way, but a lot of times it was. Yeah. That's just, that's the same thing that happened it, with me. That was the wiggle game. Yep. Dude, that's so fascinating, dude. Yep. Pedophiles think alike. Pedophiles do think alike, man. It's so messed up. And you know, it's so the whole like spotting a pedophile thing. It's so simple because they're all, they all do the same bullshit, right? They're all the same. I mean, they're crafty, but, but, but it's the same thing at the end of the day. I thought of something passingly, as you said, you're an only child. Um, I'm not. Um, I have a sister. She's two years older than me. And I don't know if, if she, she and I have never had a good relationship. Um, we've never spoken about stuff like this. And I don't think he ever did anything to her, but I have no idea. Um, and I think for a long time she resented me for, um, uh, you know, essentially causing our dad to be lost to us. Right. Um, but to this day, I've never told her how bad it was. She still thinks she actually, she probably has no idea what happened at all. I mean, she knows, she knows it happened, but she has no like context whatsoever. I've never spoken to her about it. Um, and that's just interesting. I'm, I really hope to God that, um, that she never had to deal with what I did. Yeah, that's really interesting. Have you thought about talking to your sister at all about it now that you're... Oh, I have. I have. Every time I think about it, I'm just like, I, for some reason or other, it feels like it would be a lot of work. I know that. Like, I know we're talking about how important it is to say things. I just really hate talking to my sister. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't like her. She's a lot like my dad in a lot of ways, like in a lot of his, uh, like, personal uh, mannerisms um and like the like freaking out anger issues but i do think and and you're right it's you know talking to your sister about it would definitely be work um yeah but i also think that that's sort of the type of thing where that's true if you believe it if you believe that it's that it's work then that's how it will that's the experience that you'll have doing it but it could also end up being the type of thing where um you, you guys might end up being closer than ever because it might have happened to her too. And, and even if it didn't, um, you know, it, I, it might be really helpful because she would have a much better understanding of the experience that you had and yeah. how impossible of a situation you were in. And it's, uh, you never know what can come from conversations like that, especially with people Absolutely. that you're close with. And uh, so if you ever do talk about it, I would, I would love to hear about it. Now that you say that, I should, uh, I, I should definitely pursue that. Or at least I should, at the very least, I should send her this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At the very least, I should. Um, so, yeah, I, that's, that's probably a good idea. You're right. I, I should say something. Um, if I'm going to talk about how great it is to talk about it, <laughs> right, it, would, be, it would be consistent in, in belief to say something to her about it. It would be, that would, that would be the consistent view. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, did you you know anyone else growing up that went through anything similar or have you ever talked to anybody who's been through something similar? Um, I know a lot of girls who've been assaulted, um, which is like, unfortunately, which is like everybody. Um, sadly it's, it's like everybody. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't think so. Or if they have, they haven't said anything. Yeah. I felt very alone in that. Dude. Same. It's and what and it's so crazy now after putting out the stand up and hearing about all these people from my high school even that yeah. were molested and it's like everyone felt alone and we were all together. <laughs> like no one was talking about it. But yeah, we there were so many like so many of us about it. just in the shadows about it. Like I had um one of my uh one of my friends uh, who was on the Cornell soccer team. Uh, he and I, he, after I posted the stand up, he reached out to me and told me that he had, he got raped by his, uh, his soccer coach when he was 11. And now he like, 
uh, I guess after do- seeing the stand up, he started making because he's like he raps and stuff, and so he started mm-hmm. making a he made a rap about it, and I was like, this is so sick, like. <laughs> If you like took a bunch of people that were like, you know, turning their traumas into various, you know, art forms, um, it would just, yeah, it, it's just, it's just cool to hear however people are processing it. Yeah. Dude, I'm a songwriter uh, myself um, and I, I keep on kind of pushing it off, but I want to make a song that usually when I get a song, I, I start with a name, right? Um, and I just want to call it when the bomb goes off. Um, and I've got all kinds of different ways I could do it. I, but like the bomb goes off could mean a bunch of things. It could mean the, the day, um, like the day that like my dad got taken away, right? That shit storm. Um, it could be like when my dad has an explosion, right? Or I could go literal and be like, um, be like, I hope my dad is in the blast vicinity when the bomb goes off. Right. Or I could do all three, Right. Um, but I, I would like to work on that. Um, I think that, I think that would be dope, man. Be funny. I could make a, I could probably make a video about that too. Um, you should. Yeah. I like how your, your channel is very focused, right? Uh, mine is not, I don't know if you saw any of my videos, but, um, they are literally all over the place. Um, like anything from, um, like reviews of like stuff. Like I have some old tool reviews that are like really cringe. Um, and actually some of my new ones are also pretty cringe, but I've reviewed tools. I've reviewed audio and lighting gear. Um, I've done, I had this series I made called, I listen to music and drink tea. Um, and then most recently I uploaded a video called the fake documentary. Um, which is just, um, it's, it's a fake documentary. It's exactly what it sounds like. And it's ridiculous. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I, I love how you're very focused, right? Um, I can't like necessarily maintain a, a specific audience because my content's all over the place. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, and just, yeah, that's a great idea that you had there. And, um, I respect that. I, I love your channel and I hope, um, I hope that you see, you know, millions of subscribers someday because millions of people need to see it. Thank you, man. And right back at you. I, I can't, I really can't express how cool it is to be able to talk to a complete stranger who we yeah. met virtually in the YouTube comment section on Monday. And now we're having a super in-depth conversation about the worst things that happened to us in our lives. Exactly. <laughs> like just two years ago, right? The only person I would tell is the person I trusted the most in my life, right? And now I'm telling just a random dude I met on the internet. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just, I was just like, you know what? Screw this. Right. Like I, I'm, I'm ready to just like completely like vomit all this information out. Right. I'm just, I'm just going to, you know, put pen to paper, get, get this over with. Right. This needs to happen. Um, and it, it's felt great. I, I feel awesome, man. Dude, uh, <laughs> I feel freaking awesome. Uh, so thanks for that. I, I appreciate this opportunity. Dude, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have had you on this, man. And, and yeah. I would love this to be an ongoing conversation. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, I, I, I think it's so cool that like we can feel this way and how good it feels. And also know that like for people that are seeing this and listening and, you know, whether that's soon or years from now, I think that, that it can really help people. Um, and we know it can because it helps us. So (laughs) that's like, it's foolproof. And I just, uh, I really admire your, your ability to just like have in such a short time, be so comfortable and confident talking about your experience as openly as you have. I mean, that's rare. It's super rare. And in my, in my case, I I could give you a simple reason for that. It's just because it felt so awesome. Right. (laughs) It's yeah. the same pe- reason people get addicted to drugs, right? It feels amazing. And you're like, I, I want to feel like this all the time. Yeah. Right. And so you're like, okay, but like, obviously with drugs, like when you do it all the time, it kills you when every time you talk about it, it feels even better than the last. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, it's like a drug that develops reverse tolerance yeah, um, yeah. and it's probably really good for you. Right. 
the best, man. It's the best for you. It's, like, it's absolutely probably better for your health. Like stress kills. Absolutely. Right? It's not only like a stress reliever, but like, you're literally dealing with shit that that most people just never deal with. It's yeah. like you're and it and and I feel like there's the there's a stigma associated with like processing trauma. It's like it feels like you have to you have to be so sad and like you know so and the, and that's a huge element of it like i've cried countless times thinking about all oh, this same. stuff it's that's that's our body's natural way of processing this stuff but I, I i feel like it's like by talking about it in the way that we're talking about it it's it just shows like a whole nother side to recovery that like can kid doesn't have to be this grim gloomy thing i mean it's like yeah. I, i've been smiling like 90 percent of this conversation absolutely <laughs> I, I probably haven't been smiling as much, but that's that has nothing to do with my internal emotions or whatever. I no, just, I just yeah. have a very neutral face, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, I, I could probably uh, benefit from some dental work. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, it's just a crazy. Si- and I, like, obviously, I've cried countless times too, but that's just an interesting thought, like thinking about how it's emotionally affected me. Um, sometimes that has scared me a little, how little it has emotionally affected me, I guess. Like, I think to this day, um, like in terms of like how it affects me today, it's not even my tr- most traumatic life experience, right? Like it doesn't affect me as much. Like, um, last year I, uh, I got into a motorcycle accident, right? I crashed a motorcycle, right? Um, and that's like a hundred times more traumatic to me than this situation was. And I don't know if that's because it was so long ago or whatever, but I'm just so thankful that it hasn't affected me in a huge negative way. Uh, but obviously, my heart goes out to anybody who right, has felt that. And I, nobody should have to go through that alone. Right? Nobody. Um, it, it just, like, otherwise it just bottles up inside. And it just, you know, like, blows up, you know, eventually. Yeah. And, and. Totally, man. I sorry about your accident. Um, that's crazy, and I—I yeah. I mean, I, it's the same thing that happened, uh, and not the same physical thing, but the same experience of like when my grandpa died last year. I felt unbelievably more affected mm-hmm. by that than the molestation, and I and this it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how you know how we can't imagine what it would be like getting raped or something now and the impact that it would have just like. So it's a blessing that it happened so long ago, and it's also a curse because it impacts your childhood and your development and everything. It's like it's no, there's no, it's not black and white. It's like it, it's yeah. all so, it's all so complicated. But all, all we really know is that like it feels good talking about it now. And how cool is that? How fucking cool yeah, is right? it that like that's what it feels like to be talking? It would be such a bummer to be so upset talking about I it. I enjoy this so much that like. A, a big part of me, like, like wants wants to like steal your idea and like do this myself. Do it, like, do it. Like, talk to, I just, dude, it I just would feel awesome. Dude. Don't ever feel like you're stealing. This is the whole point of this is is exactly what we're doing. It's spreading the word. I would love for you to be interviewing anyone. I mean, don't you have my full permission to do whatever you want right, with it, thanks, bro. bro? Of course. I I definitely now that I've I've thought about this, I've always looked for like a like a life purpose, or not just a life purpose, but like something I can do that's bigger than myself. And this is like this is it, right? Yes. Like, this is it. Like we can, you know, because of our experience, we have the unique ability to uh to help people more than somebody who hasn't gone through this, right? And like somebody needs to get on a podium and be like, this is a problem, right? Because I think the people who haven't been molested, the, the other four fifths, right? They just don't know, right? They just don't know how big the issue is. And I was molested. I didn't even know that figure. I mean, I didn't even know that was a thing. And I've talked about it, right? Like I don't even just stuff it down like some people do. So probably, I mean, just, you know, again, n- no no evidence here, but 98% of people probably have no idea that this is as big of a problem as it is. Um, and it's, it's huge. It really is. And that's why, yeah. you know, I would never feel uh, territorial of the, of the concept of interviewing people about their trauma. Yeah. It's like, I, yeah. I, the more, more power to you, man. 
one thing one thing this makes me think of is a lot of people say like every child's life matters, right? This is a this is an argument for gun control, and I'm not saying that argument is false or not, but like, and some people then they'll then they'll bring up abortion, and then they'll then they'll debate till the end of all time. But like every child's life matters. Let's talk about the 70 million children who have been you know molested, right? Um, like there are probably some, there are probably some people who would, who would say they would rather like die than have to go through that again or whatever. I personally do not agree with that. I value my life very highly, but, uh, like that is so important. There's a, you know, there is a difference between life itself and quality of life and getting molested is not good quality life. <laughs> it wasn't fun at the time, but it's pretty fun talking about it now. It is. It is. It, it, and like, it's kind of funny. It is funny. Like, I mean, which is why you make the, like just the idea that like just like a you know just pedophiles in general. I, something about it like maybe it's maybe that's fucked up, but I think it's hilarious. It's so ridiculous. It's like how does this happen? What is going through their head? It the whole situation is so nuts that it that it's funny. Yeah, I know, man. I know it really is, and I think part of it probably why we're able to l- laugh about it more easily than people who haven't gone through it, which is obviously not true for everyone. There are so many people that have a really hard time laughing about it who have been molested yeah. and, you know, vice versa. But I think it's because having been through it and experienced it, it's like, like words. It's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> it's yeah. like- and I, th- I think part of the issue is people who haven't had it happen to them. They feel like if they laugh about it, they're like an asshole. Right. And to those people, I say, no, you're not laugh about it right because once you laugh about it we're normalizing the the conversation again right yeah i think it was wayne dwyer who said uh it's impossible to be afraid it's impossible to laugh and be afraid of the same thing uh because laughter is just like it's it's just a cure for that dude that's awesome i i never even thought of that that is such a good such a good concept and i think that that's like the that's why the stand-up works for sort of the introduction to the conversation because it's like we've already laughed about this a lot for a little like now talking about it is fine it's like there's there's nothing to be afraid of again it's just it's just words (laughs) it's just whatever right and then like communication and honesty like i think i think our country or just our society has a communication and honesty problem in general right and once you've told somebody you're molested you could tell them anything Exactly. It's like, what are exactly. you gonna, what are you gonna find right. out about me now? In terms of things that you're like self conscious about, or embarrassed oh, about, or ashamed of, it's like it really just it doesn't you, matter. It doesn't matter once you get out the worst thing. <laughs> like, dude, you know what? Fuck it, dude. I've got some like other issues that have like it. it th- this has caused masturbation issues for me, right? Because I started so early, I never masturbated like this. I I fucking hump a blanket, right? And dude, it's not comfortable to just do it straight over. So it has to go off to the side. My penis is cur- permanently curved to the side. because <laughs> I think that's actually pretty common though. Not, yeah. not for the and, same yeah. reason necessarily, yeah. but yeah, cur- curved dicks are yeah. so. Uh, to be clear, it still does the job just fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, it'll get the job done just fine. Right. Um, but, uh, but it's messed up, right? Um, it's, it's kind of weird. Uh, and that's just, you know, one thing, but on the other side, it also has given me a superpower, which is that, um, like, because I'm like kind of unsensitive in a lot of other like positions or whatever, Dude, if I have a girl on my dick riding, I could literally go all day, literally all day. That is a superpower. Like, like most guys, they last like what thirty seconds. I could last all day, bro, all day. That's dope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the benefits of child molestation. Yeah, yeah thanks. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, dude, now I get to have like sex with somebody I actually want to have sex with. Right? Like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah how dope is it having like want wanted consensual sexual exactly. pleasure it feels so awesome it's like wow not a, i want to i want to have sex with this person this person wants to have sex with me oh my gosh this is a match made in heaven right yeah dude that's so funny yeah we should start spreading the rumor if yeah guys who got molested just have like 
They can just go forever. Yeah. <laughs> and then everybody's going to come out and say they were molested. Exactly. That's what we got. We got to make it cool. <laughs> Dude, making mol- I, that's actually not a bad idea. I mean, not not that specific thing, but just trying to make I mean, you don't want to make getting molested actually cool in the sense that like somebody wants to go out and get molested. Yeah, yeah so we're making it they're... not we're making it not uncool. Exactly. No, that, that, yeah. And, you know, we can ride around on our Heelys. Yeah. Well, listen, man, this is, um, this has been really, really awesome. And I feel like yeah. we, could, we could talk for, for ages, but in the interest of, uh, not going too long for the listener's sake, um, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. Thank you so much for coming on. It's, uh, this was incredibly fun and, and super helpful for me, just myself, let alone the people that are listening. And I hope that for the people that are listening and watching you, you, uh, got some benefits out of this and, um, thank you for being so open and, and, and just so willing to share your story. Will. and is there anything that um, you want to plug? I, I know your YouTube channel is uh, Will Ogden. Yeah, my it's William Ogden. It's just my full name. Uh, that's my YouTube channel. Um, I uh, I make music under the band name The Trees, um, which is going to be impossible to find because there are numerous bands called The Trees. So if anybody's looking for it, search "I Got So High Last Night," um, and you will find it. Um, that is one of our songs. Um, and also, if you are in Nashville and you require sound services, go to NashvilleLiveSound.com, um, and uh, I will do your events um, for a reasonable price. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I think that's uh, those are all my plugs. And you were on um, Instagram at at Nashville underscore Live underscore Sound. That's what it was. Okay, um, nice. Anyways, uh, dude, let's like totally collaborate. Hundred percent, um, man. In any capacity, if you think of something you want a second thought on or if i come up with an idea let's let's work together and you know figure this uh figure out this uh huge problem you know i would love that man any yeah it, reach out anytime i can't thank you enough and uh i look forward to doing more episodes like this or just working with you in the future absolutely thank you so much for having me